Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue looking at earthquakes and the Earth's interior. So in this video we're going to be thinking about tsunamis and the destruction that they cause and this is going to correspond to section 12.10 of your textbook. So to begin with we need to think about how do tsunamis form. Now the most common way that we can form tsunamis is at convergent plate boundaries, more accurately ocean-ocean and ocean-continent convergent plate boundaries because we need to have subduction taking place. So at our convergent plate boundary what's happening? Well we have a piece of oceanic crust which is of course subducting under a piece of either oceanic crust or continental crust. Now we know that there's going to be a substantial amount of friction between the two plates as they try and move past each other. So what happens in this situation is the nose of this plate here is actually locking into the piece of oceanic crust which is being subducted. Now because these two pieces of crust are locked into each other, they're going to move as one. The thing is, is that this piece of oceanic crust has lots of force behind it, and so it's going to want to keep subducting. So what happens is, is the nose of this piece of crust here starts getting pulled downwards along with the oceanic crust. So think of it like having a ruler and just essentially pulling one end of the ruler down. You're just bending that end of the ruler and obviously eventually you're going to release it and the ruler is going to snap back to its original shape. So most of the tsunamis that form are fault related and they are uh, often formed at the, uh, at the convergent plate boundary, so relatively near the trench. Now, what's going to happen is, is this nose is being steadily pulled down because it's locked into the piece of oceanic crust. Eventually, though, the uh, friction is going to be overcome by built up strain. And so this nose of the piece of crust here is going to detach itself from the oceanic crust here. And this is going to cause the nose of this piece of crust to bounce up. It's going to rebound, just like pulling down the end of a ruler and then releasing it. Now, because this piece of crust here is going to bounce upwards, obviously as it rises, it's going to displace the water which is located directly above it. And so that's going to cause the displaced water to rise up and form a wave on the surface like so. Now, this wave is going to radiate away in all directions from the point where the sea floor has risen up. However, this displaced water is actually going to split and go in two separate directions. So this wave here that's formed is going to divide in two. One half is going to go this way and one half is going to move towards the coast this way. And you can see that in this image here. So you can see this wave has split in two with one half moving into open water and the other half moving back towards the coastline. And of course, when it hits the coastline, the tsunami then has the capacity to um, inundate the coastline and of course cause significant damage. So the final question is, is why are tsunamis so big? So tsunamis are essentially just a giant wave. Typically they will be many meters in height, you know, normally about 10 or 15 meters. So they're very, very substantial. So it's a lot of water that's hitting the land. The question is, is well, why are they so big compared to regular waves? Well, to start with, there's a substantial amount of water being displaced, so that helps to explain why they're so large. There's a lot of material on the move. Now, in terms of why the wave actually forms, that's due to the decrease in sea level as you approach the coast. So if you'll notice, as you approach the coast here, you can quite clearly see that the depth of water steadily gets shallower the further up the shelf you go. So as the, as the wave that forms due to the split of this, uh, this wave here, as the wave starts to move towards the coast, what's going to happen? Well, the sea level is going to get lower, so there's going to be less water, and this causes the water, which is part of the wave, to begin to pile up as the sea, as the sea level begins to uh, decrease. And so this piling up of the water leads to a wave forming, but of course, because there's so much material, the wave isn't just a standard wave, this is considerably larger. And so that's what actually causes the tsunami.
So tsunami generation is actually a relatively straightforward process. The, the vast majority of the time it occurs at convergent plate boundaries where we have subduction taking place. But the most important thing to remember is that when the crust rebounds and displaces the water above it, the displaced water will split in two and will go in opposite directions, one half into open water and one half back towards the continent. And so we're actually going to look at a particular earthquake in a couple of slides time from uh, Chile in 1960. And you're going to see the effects of uh, this displaced water splitting and going in two separate directions. So what are the other possible causes of tsunamis? Because it's not just um, earthquakes that lead to tsunamis, although earthquakes are by far and away the most common cause. You can also get tsunamis which are the result of landslides. So in this case you can see we have a, an island here which is situated above sea level and you can see there's been a rather large slip along this edge here and this is the landslide actually picked out in this kind of golden yellow colour. So obviously all the material that's being dumped into the water is going to, once again, it's going to displace water. So all the material coming off here is going to create a really large bow wave, a bit like a really big ship. And so this bow wave, of course, is going to be pushed into open water and it's going to travel away. And eventually the wave itself is going to form as the water level begins to get lower and lower and lower as it approaches the coast. You can also have tsunamis produced by volcanic eruptions. The classic example of this is Krakatoa. So Krakatoa was, or well, still is in fact, a volcano uh, in Indonesia, and it, ex and it uh, destroyed itself in an extremely large, extremely powerful volcanic eruption. It's predicted to possibly have been the largest noise uh, for which humans, you know, which humans could possibly have heard. And so this explosive eruption, which destroyed a volcano, completely obliterated it. Well, once again, what's that going to do? That explosion is going to create a very, very large wave. And so the, the water that was displaced by the explosion got pushed towards the surrounding islands. And once again, as the water became shallower, all of this material, all this water began to pile up. And it led to the formation of a very large tsunami, which inundated the surrounding islands. So in terms of tsunami activity, one of the classic examples of tsunamis is the uh, Chilean earthquake in 1960. So this uh, red spot here essentially represents the point of the earthquake. And obviously this is where our tsunami is going to uh, emanate from. Now we know that what's happening here is the uh, continental crust, so the South American plate, is being pulled down by the subduction of the Nazca plate underneath it, and we know that eventually they're going to detach from one another and the continental crust is going to bounce up, displacing the water. So what's going to happen to that displaced water? Well, as we've, as we've already looked at, uh, half of it is going to move back towards the coast. So half of that displaced water is going to head towards Chile, where of course it hit the coast, forming a tsunami that was about 10 meters high and inundated this coastal area. And you can see the destruction here. So what about the other half of the water? Well, the other half of the water is going to travel across the Pacific. Now, each one of these lines represents one hour. So after five hours, the tsunami was here, 10 hours, it was here, 15, 20, and it hit Japan after about 22 hours. Now, when the tsunami is moving through open water, you because the water is so deep, you won't even know it's happening. You might feel, you know, if you're on a boat, you might feel your boat rise and fall for a second, but you wouldn't really take much notice of it. It's only when the water starts to get shallower and that water starts to pile up, do you actually get the wave itself forming. So anyway, so half of this tsunami is moving across the Pacific and eventually it interacts with the island of Hawaii right here. And so this tsunami hits the Hawaiian Islands and it ends up forming a tsunami which is about 11 meters in height and it kills several people in the process. And then about another seven to eight hours later, it went and hit Japan once again, causing substantial damage.
So tsunamis will not only cause damage to the coastline which is closest to them, it will, they can also cause damage a substantial distance away. So in this case you can see this tsunami took approximately 22-23 hours to move across the entire width of the Pacific Ocean. So, you know, these things move pretty fast. So there's lots of water and lots of power behind them. So when they do occur, they can be extremely destructive. Uh, other examples of classic tsunamis are, of course, the Japanese tsunami of 1993, and then, of course, there was the relatively recent uh, Fukushima-related um, uh, uh, well, damage caused to the Fukushima nuclear power plant due to a relatively recent uh, earthquake and related tsunami, which also occurred in Japan. And another classic example is New Guinea in 1998, where the coastline was hit very, very hard once again due to a tsunami that formed at a convergent plate boundary. All right, thank you for watching everybody and have a good day.